Aren't you glad today that we have a God who can deliver us? Doesn't matter what you're going through today. It doesn't matter with what you are struggling. We serve a God who is more powerful than any struggle, any sin, any temptation, any problem that we can have. And our prayer today is that you will put your trust in him and allow him to deliver you. We're glad you're here today. If you're visiting for the very first time, I'd love to have the opportunity to meet you at the conclusion of the service. Vicki and I will be down front, and we'd love to do that. I have two very special guests that are here today, and it fits in perfect because we're in the middle of the series that we've called Family Goals, and my mom and dad are here today. And so, mom and dad, would you stand? Would you just kind of stand? And I've kind of uh, touted them just a little bit, and we appreciate so much. Um, I've said before, and it's true, that um, I am who I am by the grace of God, but they have a lot to do with it, and God has used them as an example in my life, and so I appreciate them. Well, I still have a huge ring in this microphone. I'm not sure whether Evan's up there. We can, we can do that. If not, I'm just going to grab the other microphone if we can't balance that out. So it was February 14th, of last year. You probably remember everything seemed normal at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, not far from here. It was Valentine's Day. Everybody was in a festive spirit. The first shots rang out at 2.22 in the afternoon. For the next six minutes, the uh, callous and cowardly gunman carried out his deadly assaults on uh, the school hallways and the school classrooms. At the end of his six-minute hate-inspired attack, 14 students and three faculty members lost their lives. 14 others were injured. As parents heard about the attack, some of them via text message from their kids. Others heard about it on the news, but as parents heard about the attack, they frantically, as you and I would have, began arriving at the school looking for their child, wanting to make sure that, that their child was safe, wanting to make sure that their child was okay. Hundreds of parents were relieved to find their son and their daughter safe and secure, some of them not for several hours. And I can't even begin to imagine the agony and the worry that they went through while 14 other parents received the tragic news that their child was killed in the attack. So a year later, today, we remember those families we remember them along with the families of the three faculty members who were also killed on that day. Today we mourn with them, and today we pray for them. So would you do me a favor and bow your head today, and let's have a moment and pray for our neighbors not far from here who experienced that unbelievable tragedy a year ago. Father, when we see evil manifested in our world, it shocks us, it surprises us. And Father, last year, Lord, man, what that school and what those families went through is a demonstration of the fact that we live in a sinful and fallen world. And Lord, today we remember those families, 17 families who lost a loved one, who had no idea when the day began that they would experience the horror that they experienced. So Father, how we pray for them today, I pray that you'd give them grace. I pray that you'd give them peace. I pray that you would help them to sense your presence during this time and help them to find the peace that can only be found in Jesus Christ. We pray for the students and the faculty members there at, at MSD. And, and Father, how we pray that you would be with them as they minister to those kids. And Lord, I pray for the churches around that area, Church by the Glades and Park Ridge Church and 
other churches there in the area that are still ongoing ministering to those students. Father, how I pray that you would use them and uh, help them to minister to those families. Lord, we lift them up to you in prayer. And Lord, we do pray that you would protect our kids. Lord, this is happening all too often in our schools. And Lord, I pray that you would protect our kids. Help us as families to keep our kids safe and secure. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that in mind, there is nothing that gives you and I as a parent greater peace than to know that our kids are safe, secure, and healthy. Do you agree with me today? Those of us that have kids, we want to know that, that when they leave in the morning, they'll come back in the afternoon. We want to know when they're traveling that, that they're safe, that they arrive there safely. We want to know that they're healthy. Uh, we want to know that, that they're okay. Or as a parent, there's nothing that gives us more peace than knowing that. Follow me today, though. That desire, though, should not just be true for their physical well-being. We worry for their physical well-being. We want them, as I mentioned, to be safe and secure and happy and healthy. But we should also be equally concerned. We should be equally worried, as it were, for our kids' spiritual welfare. I say this morning that we should be more interested in our kids' spiritual life than in our kids' school life, sports life, and social life. Let me say that again because that's the premise of what we're talking about today. We should be more concerned about our kids' spiritual life than their school life, their sports life, and their social life. Jonas, this is still really echoing down front. I don't know whether we can turn these speakers off or, or what. Your, your number one concern as a parent should be, do my family members have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And today we're not just talking about our kids. We're talking about all of our family members. Do, do my family members, I'm going to come down a little closer with you. Can I do that? Do, do my family members have a personal relationship with Jesus? Are my kids, are, are my brothers and sisters, are my mom and dad submitting to Jesus as Lord? Are they growing as his disciple? We should be equally concerned about that as parents. I've, I've mentioned before, and I want to be positive today. I don't want to be negative, but I'm afraid that in our American Christianity, we have become satisfied with the fact that our kids made a decision when they were little, and we become satisfied with that. And we are not equally passionate about their spiritual growth, their spiritual maturity, their spiritual usefulness as we are. Are they a success in this life? Are they a good husband? Are they a good dad? Are they a good mom? Are they successful in their job? And church, I submit to you today that our number one, that's what we've been talking about in this whole series, our number one priority as parents is to make sure that our kids have a relationship with Jesus and they're growing in their walk with Him. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 3 John. 3 John is a, is a book that we don't get to very often. Almost at the end of your Bibles, 3 John. I want to read just three verses in 3 John. Today, I'm going to be extremely practical Generally, we're expositional and we take a passage of Scripture and dive into it. I want to be extremely practical today. And I want to help us as parents, wherever we are in our parental spectrum, because you might sit back today and say, Brian, this doesn't apply to me because, because my kids are grown and they're out of the house. Or, uh, or, uh, uh, or, 
or I don't have kids anymore, or, or whatever. But I want you to know, wherever your kids are in this spectrum, whether they're young, whether they're middle schoolers, whether they're teenagers, or whether they're adults, we still have the responsibility to work in their hearts and in their lives. And so, notice these words that John says, and, and let's apply them to our lives today. In Third John, verses 2, 3, and 4. John says this, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, that you may be in good health as it goes with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. Notice verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Would you, would you read that with me? That is such a great verse. Let's read verse 4 together. All of us, let's lift our voices and read it together. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Admittedly, John is writing these words to his spiritual children, not his physical children. Uh, the, the phrase, my little children, is a, is a phrase that John uses repeatedly through his books. For example, in 1 John chapter 2, and verse 1, John said, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So, so, so John looks upon those to whom he is ministering, those who were a part of his congregation, as it were, his flock, and he views them as his little children. And as their spiritual father, John experienced incredible joy watching his children lay aside their idols, grow in their faith, and walk in the truth. As a pastor, I can certainly second John's sentiments. I would tell you there is nothing that gives me greater joy as a pastor than watching our congregation grow in their faith. And if you ask me today, Brian, what is your goal for our family? What is your goal for our congregation? My goal very simply is this, that you would learn to love Jesus with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might, that you would be constantly turning away from sin and that you would be turning towards Jesus. As a pastor, that gives me unbelievable joy. But I certainly believe that this truth can be applied to nuclear families. Just as Papa John, I'll call him, not the Papa John that you know, the originator of the Papa John's pizza, but just as Papa John or Father John was thrilled to see his spiritual children walk in truth, so we should be as parents. So let me give you just a couple of really practical things today. If you have your outline, you can follow along today. Just a couple of, of simple truths. The first is this. There should be nothing that brings you more joy than knowing your family is walking with Jesus. Let me say that again. There should be nothing in your life, in your family's life, that brings you more joy than knowing your children are walking with Jesus. Now, as a dad, I'm, a, I'm the father of three kids. I know that there's a lot of things that our kids do that, that bring us joy. And, and our kids brought us a lot of joy. Vicki and I enjoyed watching our oldest son, Justin, play soccer and receive all-county accolades there in Ohio. We love to watch Mark play football at Dade Christian School down here uh, in South Florida. Mark, Mark grew from an out-of-shape football wannabe when he started in ninth grade to an all-county center when he graduated from high school. Man, we love that. We, we listened with pride as Justin sang at his high school concert and the crowd responded with a standing ovation and here's mom and dad with our chests out like this. I mean, so proud of our kids. We watched them both graduate from high school and college and then seminary. We've seen Amber, our little girl, endure physical disabilities, pain, and a difficult life. 
All, all of those are tremendous accomplishments. And like you, we're extremely proud of our kids. You could say the same thing. I just have the microphone today. And you could be talking about your kids and what your kids have done and how proud you are of them. Those are all tremendous accomplishments. Yet church, hear my heart today. As wonderful as all of those things are, they wouldn't mean anything if our kids were not following Jesus. You see, as, as parents, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles, whatever your relationship is with the kids in your family, we need to be very careful not to confuse earthly success with eternal security. Did you catch that? We need to be extremely careful not to confuse earthly success with eternal security. All of us want our kids to get a good education. All of us want our kids to experience the best out of this life, to, to play sports, to take music lessons, to get involved in a host of other extracurricular activities. We want them to go to college, have a good career, be financially independent, have a, a happy marriage, and to give us plenty of grandkids, right? All of us want that for our kids. Those are wonderful goals. But without Jesus... Without Jesus, those goals are temporary. The, those goals are, are empty and without an eternal purpose. You see, if we are not careful, we can emphasize the temporal and de-emphasize the spiritual. Let me tell you how Jesus said it. Jesus said it this way in Mark chapter 8 and verse 36. He said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits, loses his own soul? Okay. Can I change just a word in there without doing damage to the passage? What does it profit your child? What does it profit your sibling? What does it profit your family member? to gain the whole world and lose his or her own soul. Here's what Jesus is saying. In other words, earthly health, earthly success, and even earthly happiness pale in comparison to the eternal security and the spiritual growth of your children and your family members. In other words, here is what he should, here's what Jesus is saying. Nothing should bring us more joy than to see our children walking in truth. So, so I put a second bullet point there because I want to flesh that out just a little bit further, all right? You see, we as, as parents, as grandparents, as family members should desire both our family's salvation and their sanctification. We should desire both their salvation and their sanctification. Notice what John says. He didn't say, I have no greater desire than that my child make a decision when they're young. That's not what he said. He said, I have no, he didn't say, I have no greater desire that my child gets baptized. And there's nothing wrong with both of those things. I made a decision when I was young, and I was baptized when I was young. And my kids made a decision when they were young, and they were baptized when they were young. But that's not what John says. John says, I have no greater joy than to hear what? Then my children are walking in the truth. The phrase walking in. In truth, or walk in truth, means more than just having said a prayer to accept Jesus. To walk has the idea of moving forward. To walk has the idea of progressing. We can, we can add two parts to that. John obviously is talking about salvation. He's talking about the forgiveness of sins to being restored to a right relationship with God. He's talking about that salvation, that moment when our son, our daughter, our brother, our sister, our parents give their heart and life to Jesus Christ at whatever time they do it, even when they're 94 years old, and they give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. 
Christ. That salvation experience is so very important. But John is talking about much more than that. He says, I have no greater joy than to see that my children are what? Are walking in truth. He's not just talking about salvation, but he's talking about sanctification. He's talking about their growth. He's talking about their personal relationship with Jesus. We use the term sanctification. It, it comes from a term that's related to the term saint and sanctify. Both of those words have the idea of holiness, personal holiness. And so sanctification is the process through which you and I become more and more like Jesus. That's what John is talking about. John says, I have no greater joy than to see my kids are growing in their faith, to see them being sanctified, becoming more and more like Jesus, turning from their sin and turning towards Jesus Christ. I say that, mom and dad, in, in such a loving way. Don't be satisfied that your child has made a decision to accept Jesus, you should want them to walk in the truth. This morning, I want to get extremely practical. And, and I want us to realize that it's our responsibility to share the gospel, to share the truth of Jesus with our kids. And often we have parents that ask us these questions. How do I tell my son and daughter about Jesus? What words should I use? How do I know when they understand? And how do I know whether they believe or not? Should I pressure them? Is it my job anyways? Isn't that why we have Sunday school teachers? <laughs> Isn't that why we have pastors? Isn't that why we have youth pastors? To be able to talk to our kids about these things. We've challenged you in this series that it's not the Sunday school teacher's job. It's not the youth pastor's job. It's not the pastor's job. It's your job to do that. And so today, we want to give you some practical ways to share the gospel with your family. And so if you have your notes there, all right, uh, I'm going to walk through a couple of things, all right? So the second point on your outline is this. There are practical ways to share the gospel with your family. We've already alluded to some of these in the series, and so let me make reference to them again. The first is this, and this I would say is one of the most important. Continually repeat the truths of the gospel. Let me say that again. Continually repeat the truths of the gospel. You remember we started this series in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Where, where Moses tells the Israelites, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, and you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then he tells parents, Take these truths and repeat them. Declare them to your kids in the morning when you get up, as you're walking to school, as you put them in bed at night. Repeat the truths of the Gospel over and over and over and over and over again. Continually repeat the truths of the gospel. So you might sit back and say, okay, Brian, I get it. I'm supposed to continually repeat the truths of the gospel. So what should I tell them? <laughs> All right, so what, what are the truths that I should share with them? I want to give you four things. And, and we've, we've called this the four-chapter gospel. A few months ago, we did a series called The Story of God, and we went through these four things. Let me give you four things that, that you ought to be rehearsing in the heart and mind of your kids 24-7. Whenever you get an opportunity, it doesn't matter what age they are. The first is this. They need to know that they were created in the image of God. So I would tell them, you are created in in God's image. Genesis 1, 27 tells us that, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Here's the idea that I want us to catch. You were created. Your kids were created. We need to tell them, you were created for the purpose of reflecting the image of God. Catch that, church. Our kids need to hear that. 
that they were created for a purpose. They weren't randomly placed on this planet. Their purpose is not to go out and get a job and to be successful and, and to make a living. They were created for the purpose of reflecting the image of God. That's what Genesis chapter 1 is all about. We were created to be image bearers of God. So here's what I wrote in my notes. What a high calling. That, that, that calling is, is much higher than just getting an education. That calling is much higher than making a living, being a good husband or a good wife or a good parent or being successful. Remind your kids who God created them to be. Does that make sense, church? Everybody's just kind of looking at me today. Does that make sense? Kind of nod at me, all right? So somebody yell amen really loud just to make me feel good. There you go. Thank you. It's pretty bad when you got to ask for it, isn't it? Huh? So we need to tell our kids, you were created in the image of God. God made them for a divine purpose. But here's the second thing that we need to share. And by the way, this is the gospel. It doesn't matter what age. So this isn't just for kids. This is for your neighbor. This is for your coworker. This is for you and me. The second truth is this. You are broken and in need of a Savior. Our kids need to hear that. They're broken and in need of a Savior. You know the story there in Genesis. It didn't take long for a man to blow it, did it? They were created in God's image in Genesis chapter 1. And, and by Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve had disobeyed a direct command of God and were expelled from the garden and were condemned because of their sin. Their, their state of perfection didn't last long. Our kids need to realize that they, like their ancestors, like their original ancestors, are broken and in desperate need of a Savior. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 says this, and there's no one who is righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and then fallen short of the glory of God. And follow me, church, I am all for building up our child's esteem. And I'm all for telling them how wonderful they are and how great they are. My mom was fantastic at that. My mom made us believe that we could do anything. I'm all for that. But at the same time, they need to realize that without Jesus, they're broken. And they cannot be successful on their own. They cannot make it on their own. They desperately need Jesus Christ. Our kids need to understand that they are broken and they are in desperate need of a Savior. Here's the third thing they need to understand, though. Jesus is the answer to their brokenness. That even though they were created in God's image and they blew it and they were broken and now they're sinners and they need Jesus, God in His great and in His immense love came and provided a way for our brokenness to be fixed. For us to be restored back to the relationship that God always intended for us to have. For us to be and become who God wants us to be. How is that accomplished? That is only accomplished through Jesus Christ. Christ, the perfect Son of God who came and lived the perfect life, was tempted in every way, just like you and I are, and yet the only difference is that He lived a life without sin. And He offered Himself as the perfect sacrifice, the righteous God for us, the unrighteous ones. And by placing our faith and our trust in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, guess what we have? We have hope. <laughs> And our brokenness is now fixed. And God makes us into who He always intended for us to be. 1 Corinthians 15.22 says this, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake God made Him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. I love illustrating it this way. So you take 
um, take a bag. I should have done it this morning. You take a bag and you just fill it with all kinds of dirt. And, and, uh, and, and you hold that and say, okay, that is your sin there. Then you take another bag that's pure and clean and empty. And that represents the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So here's what God does. God looks at us and he looks at our kids and he looks at everybody and he says, okay, let me take your sin. And he takes that sin upon himself. And he, and he pays the price for all of that sin. And if that's all he did, that would be fantastic, but that's not all he did. He took our sin, but then he what? He gives us his righteousness. He gives us his perfection. So even though we are broken, even though we are sinners, we are able to receive the righteousness of God. Not because of who we are or anything we've done, but all because of of Jesus. So here's the gospel. You're created in God's image for a purpose. But because of your sin, you're broken and you desperately need Jesus. But here's the good news. Here comes Jesus on the white horse to the rescue and pays the price for your sin and mine. And by placing our faith and our trust in Him, we're forgiven, we're justified, we're redeemed, we're reconciled, and we're restored back to who God always intended for us to be. So here's the fourth part of the gospel that you need to share with your family members. God desires to use you to build His kingdom. God desires to use us to build His kingdom. Now, we can't do that if we're broken. We need Him to fix us. But once He fixes us, He fixes us for a purpose. As we went through our message series, The Story of God, we saw that the end of your story is, the really, is really the beginning of your story. Because in Jesus, we become who God always intended for us to be. What a message for your kids. You can be useful to the kingdom of God. God desires to use you, and that doesn't just mean as a pastor or a missionary. God desires to use you as a lawyer and as a banker and as a teacher and as a businessman, as in a construction worker and as a secretary and as a waitress or a waiter or a cook. Whatever God has gifted you with, whatever talents and abilities He has given to you, you can take those talents and abilities and you can use them to further His kingdom. God desires to use you. Isn't that a great story? So, so, so church, here's what I'm saying. We need to be repeating those truths in the ears to the minds of our family members, to our kids over and over and over and over and over and over again. Our kids need to know they were created in the image of God but because of their sin, they're broken and they need a Savior. But Jesus came to the rescue and Jesus heals their brokenness and Jesus makes them right with God again and He makes them useful to the kingdom of God. Share that over and over and over again. You say, okay, Brian, at what age should I start telling them those theological truths? Should I wait till they're in high school or should I wait till they're in middle school? You start that as early as you possibly can. You want to ingrain those truths in the heart and life or heart and mind of your kids. I might show you a video next week. Justin, our oldest son, with our granddaughter Olivia, I think before she was two years old, asking Olivia, who is God? And Olivia answers, he's the creator. And and, and what, what's the other question? And, and then say there's three parts of God. What are the three parts of God? And little Olivia, two years old, says, God's a father, God the son, and God the Holy Spirit. <laughs> listen, listen, here, here's what they're doing. Here's what they're doing. 
and Lydia's not even old enough to understand the truth of the gospel yet. She hasn't fallen on her knees and said, oh God, I'm a terrible sinner. I desperately need you. She hasn't realized that, but here's what they're doing. They're taking the truth of the gospel and they're, 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 they're telling her that over and over and over and over and over and over again. And here's what's going to happen. And I can't wait until one day Olivia realizes that she's broken and she needs Jesus. And when she understands that, she already understands that Jesus died for her. And it's going to be a simple, easy decision for her to give her life to Jesus Christ. Repeat the truths of the gospel over and over again. Let me give you a second thing. I want to get a little controversial here, if I can, this morning. Here's the second truth. Realize that salvation is a process and not just a momentary decision. Salvation is a process and not just a momentary decision. Bear with me. Don't write me off as a heretic when I make a couple of statements, okay? Salvation is not just saying a prayer and asking Jesus into your heart and then going on your way and everything's good and you can live your life the way that you want to live. A prayer will not make your child a child of God. Here's what I'm saying. Bear with me. We've confused a whole generation. We've confused a whole generation and told them when they were young that all they had to do was say a prayer. They said a prayer when they were young, never really understood what they were praying, said a prayer, and never really turned from their sin and never really turned towards Jesus. And so we asked them today, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Yeah, I made a decision when I was five years old. But their life has never changed. They're not turning from their sin. They're not turning towards Jesus. They're basing everything on a prayer they prayed when they were just a little kid. I started my ministry in Atlanta, Georgia. I was telling our staff this the other day. And so part of my job when I started ministry was to knock on doors and, and share the gospel with people. And so I would knock on doors and, and invite them to our church and then look for an opportunity to share the gospel. And I would come to the place that I was ask them, have you ever trusted Christ as your savior? And the person, and over and over again in Atlanta, over and over again, Oh, my word, yeah, I've done that four or five times. I've done that a lot of times. But their life has not changed. They're, they're not living towards Jesus or, or, or living for Jesus. There's no repentance of their sin. There's no turning towards him. Here's what I want you to catch. And listen, I do believe that there's a time where we recognize our sin and by faith we turn toward Jesus. And I'm not saying that the prayer you prayed was not efficacious. But what I'm saying is that salvation is a process. It is something that God does in our lives. We have been saved. We are being saved. And we will be saved. The Bible tells us that. We need to realize that and we need to teach that truth to our kids. As a matter of fact, I was listening to Matt Chandler preach about this the other day and he said, your child's testimony should be so strong that they're a follower of Christ that they ought to be able to say, you know what? I can't recall a time in my life when I wasn't a follower of Jesus. Why is that? Because from early on in their life, you have been training them, turn from sin, turn towards Jesus. You need Jesus in your life. Allow Jesus to mold you and shape you and change you. Does that make sense? So we have people who have prayed a prayer, but there was no repentance. There was no turning from sin. There was no constant turning towards Jesus. They don't live like a believer, but they claim to be a child of God because of one momentary experience. It's not what the Bible teaches. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, Therefore, if anybody is in Christ, he's what? He's a new creation. Old things are passing away, and all things are becoming new. Paul says this in Philippians 1, 6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will complete it. He will finish it at the day of Jesus Christ. What's the idea, man? You cannot have the all-powerful, omnipotent Holy Spirit of God residing within you and your life not be changed. 
When God comes in you, He begins to change you. He begins to chip away the old, and little by little, He begins to make you into who God wants you to be. I saw a diagram not long ago that I thought was such a beautiful diagram in which this author was, was explaining the salvation process to the birthing process. Can we put that up there? So at birth, we understand the conception takes place but birth doesn't actually take place till nine months after conception, right? You get that? If you don't get that, ask somebody after church and they can explain that to you, all right? And so conception takes place, but the actual birth doesn't take place till nine months later. What do we celebrate? Nobody celebrates their conception date, right? Has anybody ever sit back and say, man, I was conceived on this date. Let's have a party. No, no, nobody knows that. We don't celebrate the conception date. Why is that? Because there's life in the womb before we even know there's life in the womb. Whenever the lady finds out that she's pregnant, she's already what? Two or three, is that right? Two or three weeks pregnant along the line. There's already a life there, and she didn't know that life was there. Does that make sense? So I would submit to you that, that, that we celebrate conversion whenever the person bows their head and they trust Christ as their personal Savior. But I would submit to you that often life begins before that. And we don't know life is there, but the Holy Spirit of God has planted the seed of the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit of God is germinating that seed. And that person is beginning to feel conviction of their sin. And it brings them to a moment in which they what? They repent of their sin and they cry out to Jesus Christ. But it's what? It's a process. And then we go on and we grow and we are sanctified. Here's what, here's what I'm challenging you moms and dads and family members. Let's be working in the lives of our kids and our family members, helping them realize that salvation is a process. It's a lifelong experience in which we are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Does that make sense today? Are you viewing me as heretical? I'm not, I'm not teaching anything different. There was, uh, I was a 16, uh, so I was a six-year-old at 1512 25th Street in Canton, Ohio. When I bowed my head, I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember what the couch felt like when I gave my heart to Christ. I remember that. I remember it like it was yesterday. I get that and understand that. But, but I'm afraid that we're emphasizing the momentary and we're not emphasizing the process. And we're hurting our kids in the process. And we're not producing generations of believers, generation after generation after generation after generation, because we're emphasizing the wrong thing. Here's the point. You want to encourage your kids to constantly be turning from their sin and turn towards Jesus Christ. Here's the third thing, and I'm coming to a close. Explain the gospel in a comprehensible way. As you, as you start either when they're young or when they're middle school or when they're teenagers, explain the gospel in a comprehensible way. Way. Let me just give you some practical truths if you're new at this. And I know we have new believing mom and dads here and, 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 and you're new at being a Christian and you're trying to figure out how to do this. Let me give you some practical tips. First of all, you can buy children's books that illustrate and clearly explain the gospel. I've just put a couple of them up there. You can get those online. You can buy them on Amazon today and you can get them. There's children's apps. Here's a wonderful, I think I have an app, the Bible app for kids that is a tremendous tool to be able to use with your kids. You can download that on your iPhone or your Android and have that there and it's got Bible readings for kids. You can do that. You say, hey, Brian, my kid's a teenager. Listen, there are teen study Bibles, fantastic Bibles. Here's what I'm saying. There are tools that you can use, that you can give to your kids to help them to grow in their faith. Help them to do that. Here's the second thing. You can begin asking open-ended questions that will help them to learn the gospel truths. Who is God? What is sin? What did Jesus do for us? 
Why did Jesus die on the cross? Those are wonderful. As Jose said last week in his message, don't ask them yes or no questions. Ask them open-ended questions in which they need to explain the gospel back to you. That will help them grow. You can download Christian children's songs that teach doctrinal and biblical truth. Have bedtime rituals, read scripture together, pray together. Don't be afraid to read the Bible to your kids. You sit back and say, Brian, they're not going to understand it. How will they understand it? That's the job of the Holy Spirit of God to do that. And you read God's word to them and allow the word of God to saturate their mind and their heart. If they're older, talk about contemporary events and how those contemporary events relate to the gospel. Here's what I want you to catch today. Here's the key. Your lifestyle has to be saturated with the gospel. That's what Moses meant when he said, talk about it when you get up and talk about it when you go to bed. Talk about it when you walk to school. Talk about it when you do this. Have a gospel-saturated life. Let me say one last thing, and I'm done. Prayer is your greatest tool to lead your family to Jesus. So having said all of that, let me say a couple of things that are so important. You can never be eloquent enough to explain the gospel to your kids. You can never be practical enough to make them understand it. If they're away from God, you can never give an argument strong enough to pull them back. There is only one person who is going to reach the heart of your child or your family member, whoever that is. There's only one person who's going to do that, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. Your greatest tool in reaching your child for Christ is prayer. Samuel said it this way. He wasn't talking about his kids. He probably should have because he struggled in reaching his kids. But Samuel said this in 1 Samuel 12, 23, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. If you have kids in your home and you're not praying for them, you should if you have family members in your home who don't know the Lord and you're not praying for them, you should. Prayer is your greatest tool. Perhaps, like me, you've struggled with knowing how to pray. God, what do I say? I mean, I say, okay, God, save my kids, and then I don't know what to say after that. How do I pray for them? Many Christian parents often feel as though their prayers fall short. Well, you and I can take comfort in knowing that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. When we're not even sure how to pray, he prays for us. And by the way, please catch this. God's not grading your prayers. <laughs> God's not up in heaven saying, ah, you know what, Brian, I wish you would have said that just a little bit differently. Go back and practice it and then come back and ask me again and then I'll think about answering your prayer. God's not grading your prayer. Here's what God sees. He sees your hearts. And the Holy Spirit of God takes your inability to verbalize what you were wanting to say. And he takes that truth to the Father and he intercedes for you. Pray. 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 Pray for your family members. You say, Brian, what should I pray? Well, as a, as a parent, you can pray simple prayers like this. Lord, you know I want to be a godly, consistent parent, but I can't do it without you. Help me to live, God, in such a way that my children know I love them and they see your qualities in me. You can pray, God, remind me often that my greatest gift to my children is to help them know you. God, help me to prepare the soil for them to, go grow, to grow deep and strong. And when the time comes to receive your salvation, Lord, help me to make the time to talk to my kids. Help me to recognize and respond to those teachable moments that you give me, those earthly standstill moments when my child asks something and you give me a God-given opportunity 
to share the gospel with them. Lord, help my kids to understand the gospel in such a way that they will turn from their sin and they will turn towards you. Someone prayed this, give them enough success to be certain of your love for them, enough favor to be aware of your kindness, but enough humility to know that they can do nothing worthwhile without you. God, help my kids to know that they need you. And if all else fails, guess what you can do? You can pray scripture for them. Take the word of God and pray scripture for them. I think I have a picture of a couple of books that you can get praying scripture for your children or praying scripture for your teenagers, books that will help you take the word of God and literally pray the word of God for your kids. So, so, so here, so my goal today is not to beat you up, but my goal today is to challenge you. You might sit back and say, okay, Brian, I, I haven't been doing that. Here's the good news. You can start right now. Doesn't matter how old your kids are. Doesn't matter where they are in life spectrum. You can begin to pray for them right now. You say, Brian, they're grown. Should I pray for them? Absolutely. You should still pray for them. I pray for my three kids every single day. I pray, God, help, help my son, Justin, to realize that he needs you. Keep him pure. Help him to realize that his only power comes from you. Help Mark, as he's a pastor, to realize that he can't do it on his own. He desperately needs Jesus. Help him to be Jesus to his wife and to his kids. I pray for Amber that God would minister to her as only he can. You say, but Brian, your kids are grown. I know that, but I still pray for them. And I bet if I put a microphone in my mom and dad's hands, they pray for me every single day. Pray. Pray for your kids, realizing that you might not be able to change them, but God can change them. So, so, so here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Here's the challenge, and I'm done. Here's what we're praying for at Hollywood Community Church, and here's why we would take the time and we would preach the series, and we would try to be practical, which is outside of our comfort zone to do this, because here's what we're praying. We're praying that God raises up families at HCC who produce kids who are disciples of Jesus, who in turn produce kids who are disciples of Jesus, who in turn produce kids who are disciples of Jesus. Oh, wouldn't it be great if you could look back and say, boy, my mom and dad were believers and my grandparents were believers and my great grandparents were believers and look at what God has done in our family. It's nothing short than a work of grace in our family. God can do that in your family. He wants to do that in your family, but it begins with you and I to realize that our most important responsibility as parents, brothers and sisters, kids, wherever we are in our family spectrum is to know that our family members know Jesus and that they're walking in truth. Let's pray together. Would you stand with me? Lord, I know I've been all over the place on this message, and I certainly don't want to say anything that doesn't honor you, that doesn't elevate Jesus Christ, that doesn't emphasize the gospel. But Father, I pray for our families today. God, I pray that you would break the hearts of moms and dads for their kids. Lord, I pray that that you would put such a burden in their heart that they would be like the Apostle Paul who said, my heart's desire, what I long for is the salvation of those, my kin, my flesh. And Lord, I pray that we would have that same passion. And Lord, I pray that you would use us to point our kids, our siblings, our family members to Jesus so that we could say, like John, I have no greater joy than that my children walk in truth. God, do that in our families. Do that in our church. 
raise up a church of strong families that are producing disciples who produce disciples who produce disciples for your honor and your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.